So, you know, one of the things I love about preaching and teaching through the Bible is you're forced into different sections of the Bible and, and, and forced to study different sections of the Bible that you might not naturally be drawn to. And that's what we're going to look at today, a, a prophetic part of the book of Daniel, as we continue our series called The Stand. Uh, my name is Timon Benson. I'm the lead pastor here at City Reach. So let me welcome you here this morning. After we have lunch, and we'd love you to come for lunch, uh, we're going to be having a, a time where we're going to be talking about the vision of the church, and we're also going to be introducing a number of new pastors. The elders have been praying, and we've been interviewing, and we have two pastoral candidates to bring before you, uh, and we're going to introduce them over lunch. So we'd love you to stick around so you can meet some of the new pastors that uh, we want to put before you for our church family. But we're studying... Daniel chapter 2 this morning in our study called The Stand. You know, last week we saw that Daniel and his three friends had been put into a vice. Here's a vice. A vice is an apparatus that the more you wind it up, the more pressure it applies. And you remember last week that for Daniel and his three friends, they had been put in a vice. The people of Judah had been put under pressure uh, the Babylonian had come, army had come, it attacked the city of Jerusalem in 605 BC and the temple was in ruins. What's more, the golden articles from God's temple had been placed in the temple of Marduk, the Babylonian god, causing the people of Israel to wonder, is Yahweh really in control? And then Nebuchadnezzar had taken the best and the brightest of the young people and he transported them from Jerusalem and taken them to Babylon to seek to re-educate them. And we said last week that the setting of this whole book is a little bit like how we feel. We, we feel like we're in exile, much like Daniel and his three friends. You know, I wonder if you are feeling under pressure. Maybe you're a young person and you're feeling under pressure to conform your sexual ethic to that of the culture. You know, we live in a culture that says that love is love. So what does it matter if two consenting adults love each other? What does it matter to you? And so maybe you're feeling that squeeze, that pressure to conform to the sexual ethic of our culture. Or maybe you feel the pressure to conform in your workplace. Everyone in your workplace is slandering other people and you feel that pressure to just join in. Or maybe, you know, nowadays we live in a global village where we have in our hands these devices which can give us you know, thoughts, everyone's thoughts from all around the world, and maybe you have started to view things on YouTube, and it's made you doubt your Christian faith. So how can you avoid the big squeeze? How can you avoid the pressure that's being applied and not conform to this culture? How can we thrive in a secular world? Well, last week in Daniel chapter 1, we, we saw that the first thing that we need to do is we need to resolve in our hearts to live for God. They had taken Daniel and his three friends and they had put on the clothes of the Babylonians. They sought to teach them to think like the Babylonians. They taught them to speak like the Babylonians. Yet Daniel and his three friends resolved in their hearts that they would live for God. And we saw last week that God honors those who honor him. And so even while in exile, away from Jerusalem, they experienced the presence and the power of God. And I said last week, if you stand for God, you will experience the presence and the power of God, not just in here, but in your everyday life as you seek to be the church on mission. Well, today we come to Daniel chapter 2, and we see that Daniel and his three friends have graduated from BU. What's BU? That's Babylonian University, <laughs> and we pick up the story in verse 1 of chapter 2. So look up on the screen or in your Bibles, we read this. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Now, if you remember from last week in chapter 1 in verse 5, it says that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had been at BU, Babylonian University, for three years, and at the end of chapter 1 in verse 18, it says that they finished their time, that when they had finished their time, they were presented before the king. Yet in verse 1 here of this second chapter, we see that the events of this chapter took place in the second year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. So what is going on? Is this like 
one of those tricky flashbacks that you see in the series Lost, where they are flashing back to an event that took place in the second year of being in BU, Babylon University. Well, no, the way that kings back in that time, the way that they recorded their reign is that their first year didn't count. It was just their regal year. So they started counting after their first year. So the events of this chapter are occurring right after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah have graduated from university. This is their first year of work, working in the king's court. And in their very first year, King Nebuchadnezzar has a bad dream. And it's such a bad dream that his spirit is troubled and his sleep left him. Now, what happens when you have bad dreams? What happens when you can't sleep at night? Well, Nebuchadnezzar goes to the only place he knows. He goes to his wise men. Verse 2, Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dream. So they came in and they stood before the king. Now, when we think of magicians and sorcerers, we, we tend to view them through a 21st century lens. You know, what immediately comes to mind when I think of a magician or a sorcerer is this, Harry Potter. However, this group in this passage is not like that. You see, the word Chaldean gives us some insight here. Uh, this word was used to describe the ancient language and the philosophy of the Babylonians. And so the Chaldeans were those who had been especially trained in ancient philosophy and the language of the Babylonians, there are a class of people who were set aside to provide answers to the everyday folk. Uh, some were the equivalent of business or political consultants. Some were trend spotters. Others were religious gurus. And these wise guys, they would use all sorts of tools in order to help them in their trade. For example, they would look at the sky and look for patterns in the sky. Uh, they, they would kill animals and they would take the liver out of the animal and they would examine the liver to see whether they could, could find anything in the liver. And of course, they sought to interpret dreams. In fact, we have found books uh, of the Babylonians that, that describe their science of dream interpretation. However, for all of their wisdom, it could not prepare them for what comes next. Verse 3 and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Right now, these guys are thinking, this is awesome. Beauty. The king is troubled, and we are going to ride in on our white horses to the rescue. But this is where Nebuchadnezzar, who is completely unpredictable, as we're going to read about, in the rest of the book of Daniel, throws them a curveball. Verse 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. Look at this. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't just want them to bring some dream interpretation. No, he wanted them to show him also what the dream was. Now, that, that being torn from limb to limb, that sounds pretty gruesome, doesn't it? Being torn in two. But also, the practice of demolishing someone's house was pretty brutal. You know, apparently, as you went through ancient cities, you would come across houses in ruins that had been there for generations, and this was a symbol of shame on that family for what they had done. Now, the wise guys respond to Nebuchadnezzar once again. They say, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Come on, king, you know the deal. You show us the dream, we give you the interpretation. But this only infuriates Nebuchadnezzar, who says, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. Now, Nebuchadnezzar knows that these wise guys cannot help. He knows that their wisdom is li limited. In fact, he says that they often speak lying. They often lie, and they cover themselves with corruption. But he's troubled. And he really needs help. 
Well, finally, these wise guys admit in verse 10, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Finally, these wise guys admit that this is out of their league, that their wisdom is not good enough, that no one can deal with Nebuchadnezzar's situation except God. Do you know there are people all around us who are dealing with troubling situations? There are people all around us like Nebuchadnezzar who have restless nights, who can't sleep. There are people all around us who are dealing with disturbing situations like relational conflicts, internal personal conflict. They're dealing with financial difficulties, with family breakdown. And where do they turn? Well, let me ask you a question. Where do you turn in your sleeplessness? Where do you turn when the, when the anxiety levels go up? Do you consult the wise guys of our culture? Do you just look to human wisdom? You see, one of the things that we are going to see that's powerful in this passage is that as Christians, we can stand out like stars in the dark night if while everyone else is freaking out, we have a wisdom, a wisdom that helps us cope with even the most tragic circumstances. So Nebuchadnezzar has encountered a troubling situation and he has looked to human wisdom for answers and it's come up bankrupt. Well, the narrative now changes and now the focus is going to be on Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's troubling situation spells trouble for Daniel. Verse 12, because of this, the fact that the wise guys couldn't tell and interpret his dream, the king was very angry and furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So, Dan, so Nebuchadnezzar's bad dream becomes Daniel's nightmare. He and his three friends have been given a death sentence. He is going to be killed because this megalomaniac of a king can't find the answers that he wants. Well, let's see how Daniel responds, verse 14. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Do you notice, class, the difference between Daniel and the other wise men, the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans, they use no discretion whatsoever in dealing with Nebuchadnezzar, whereas Daniel, he uses wisdom. And he's not anxious. He has peace. You see, the narrator is intentionally showing us that Daniel is in this class above all the other wise men. That he is different in dealing with difficult situations. Verse 15, he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. This is amazing. Whereas the other wise men, the Chaldeans, are afraid and hesitant to address the king's problem, Daniel, he steps up to the plate full of courage and is going to put everything on the line. Remember, Daniel is under a death sentence, but he's exhibiting great courage. When you face troubling situations, how do you act? Are you like the Chaldeans over here, hiding in fear? Or are you like Daniel? Do you step up to the plate and act with courage? You see, how you act in troubling situations, whether with godly courage and conviction or passive resignation, it all comes down. You may not realize this, but it all comes down actually to a matter of your worldview. As we're going to see in the next paragraph, Daniel's worldview is completely different to the worldview of the Chaldeans. And because it's different from the Chaldeans' worldview, this is why Daniel, even in a distressing situation, even under a death sentence, can stand up with courage. So here is Daniel. 
He's made an appointment with the king to interpret the dream, but he still has a problem. What's the problem, class? What's the problem? He doesn't know the dream. He's made this appointment. He's put it on the line. He's going to go in and interpret the dream, but he doesn't yet know the dream. So what does he do? He goes to his real life group, his community group. Verse 17, this is what Daniel does. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishaiah, and Azariah and his companions. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So he went to his real life group and said, guys, we're gonna pray, we're gonna get on our knees. And what happens? Verse 19, Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. You see, here is Daniel and his three friends, this small community, this small outpost of God's kingdom in a secular world. And they have a completely different worldview than that of the Chaldeans, a completely different way of seeing the world. And as a Christian, do you realize that you should have a completely different way of seeing the world? a completely different way of viewing the world, and that makes all the difference. Now, what was Daniel's worldview? What was his worldview and the worldview of his three friends? Well, if you want to find out someone's worldview, if you want to find out what someone believes about God, let me tell you something. You don't just ask them to tell you what they believe. A great place to find out what someone really believes about God is to listen to how they pray. You will find out more about what someone believes about God, not by what they say, but how they pray. This was spelled out to me the first time I went to Nepal. When I went to Nepal the first time, I got really sick. And my Nepalese pastor brothers, they came into my room. I'll never forget it. They surrounded me and they just prayed for me powerfully. And it, my friends, it humbled me. And made me realize that often when it comes to prayer, I often say to people, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And from my perspective, it's just a way of being kind and showing love and compassion. I'll pray for you. But for my Nepalese brothers, in the middle of my sickness, they truly believed that God could intervene. They were asking for God to intervene in my situation. Now, fortunately for us, isn't this amazing Guys, we get to hear a giant of the faith pray. So lean in and listen in as we hear how Daniel prayed. Verse 20, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise. And knowledge to those who have understanding. Those who already have understanding, he'll give more knowledge. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and you have made known to me what we asked of you for you have made known to us the king's matter. You see, in this prayer, you may not have picked it up, but in this prayer... There are three cornerstones of Daniel's worldview that made all the difference. Three cornerstones that are the cornerstones of Daniel's worldview. And I want to spell them out in comparison to the worldview of the Chaldeans that we read of in verses 10 and 11 of this chapter. So first, we see that Daniel and his three friends, they believe that God is in control of the events of history and human authorities. See, Daniel and his three friends, they believe that there, that there is one true creator God and this one true creator God stands outside of the material world and he stands outside of the material world, but he also is in control of the material world and is sovereign over the material world and he sets up kings and all of this sort of stuff. Now, we've already seen that in chapter one when he talked about how um, God gave Jed- uh, Jedekiah Uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. But he says it plainly here in his prayer in verse 21. He says he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets them up. So for Daniel, Daniel really believes 
You've got to get this. This is really important. He really believes that there is this God separate from creation who is sovereign over creation, who rules over all things. Now, the Chaldeans, on the other hand, the Chaldeans, on the other hand, they were just materialists. Now, you might say, didn't the Chaldeans have gods? Yeah, they did. They had Marduk, who is the god of the thunderstorm. They had Aku, who is the god of the moon. But what you've got to understand about all of their gods, all of their gods were just part of the physical world. They were just ways to explain what's happening in the physical world. The thunderstorm, that's Marduk. The moon, that's Aku. So all of the gods were actually part of this material world. And the material world is full of chaos. It's full of chance. And actually in the Babylonian creation myth, the epic of Gilgamesh, the way that God brought creation into being was it was because of a collision of the gods. The gods collided and just by random chance, this world came into being. Now, think about today. What is the cornerstone of our secular world's worldview? The cornerstone of our secular world's worldview is that all there is is this material world, right? And the cornerstone of the secular worldview is that we live in a world full of chaos, full of random events. And how did the world come into being? It came into being through a random event, the Big Bang, and everything came into being. Now I ask you, if that is your worldview, if that's the cornerstone of your worldview, that the material world is all there is, and this world is full of chaos, and it's full of random events, then how could you ever have peace? How could you have security? Because in a moment, it could be taken from you. Let me tell you something. That is why in our secular world, there is an anxiety epidemic. My wife, Tegan, is the nurse at Cedar College here, and she has said, she has noticed that young people today are dealing with anxiety and they're dealing with depression more than anything before, than any time before. And she said, the reason is, is because it's a question of worldview. What's at the foundation of this secular world's worldview? Well, secondly, we see that because Daniel and his three friends believe that God, that God exists outside of this created world and is in control of this created world, therefore, he knows all things and you can go to him for wisdom. Look in verse 21. He says, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. You see, Daniel and his three friends believe that because God is sovereign over all things and all the events of their life, they can go to him and he can give them the wisdom for how to deal with those very same events. But for the Chaldeans, all they have is human wisdom because they're just living in a material world and chaos and random chance is what rules over this world. So all they have is human wisdom. You know, it's surprising to me how much pride there is out there in our secular world when it comes to human wisdom. Have you ever heard the expression, you better not be on the wrong side of history? Have you heard that expression? Who here has heard that expression? All right, you better not be on the wrong side of history. It, it has the idea behind it that somehow history is progressing to this utopian future where there will be no more suffering and no more pain because of our technology and because of all of our advances in science, that somehow we're going to reach this utopia where everyone will be wrapped in cotton wool and they will experience no suffering and pain. But you know the reality is? You know what the reality actually is? Is that why we have more science and technology, and I'm thankful for that, I'm thankful for all the science and technology we do have. You know, all of our science and technology is more often used and twisted by our evil hearts and used for evil purposes. Who here loves the internet? I'm, I'm going to put my hand up first, all right? I don't know what it's like in your house, Mike, but when the internet goes off in our, our family for a night, we freak out. Like my kids are like, where is the internet? They're having withdrawals from the internet. So it's a, it's a brilliant thing, isn't it? But yet the internet is often used also for the most wicked things. Child pornography the trafficking of, of drugs illegally, all these sorts of things. And the idea that we can insulate ourselves 
The idea that you can insulate yourself from suffering is foolishness. Let me tell you, every single person in this room will suffer. Every single person will. And it's, it's really interesting to me. On, on one side, you have this amazing optimism. Our history is progressing to this utopian future because of our science and our, and our technology. But yet on the other hand, you have this deep pessimism that maybe we're going to stuff it all up. That maybe the robots are going to come across and they're going to take over the world like in Terminator. Have you seen that movie? Now, your eyes are too pure to watch movies like that. But maybe... Maybe this world is going to be stuffed up because of technology. You see, if you, put, if, you, if, you, if you just look to human wisdom, human wisdom is what got you into this mess, and I'm not sure that human wisdom is going to be able to get you out. And so the third aspect of Daniel and his three friends, their worldview, is because God is in control and he knows all things, you can turn to God and he can give you wisdom. He can give you truth outside of yourself that can help you interpret the events of your life. But for the Chaldeans, all they have is themselves. Now, of, of course, class, what we have to ask ourselves is this question, is that what is the cornerstones of your worldview? Are you more like Daniel and his three friends? Or are you more like the Chaldeans over here? Where is your worldview? Now, before you answer too quickly, because we tend to go, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm a Daniel. I'm a Daniel. This is my worldview. I believe, Pastor Timon. Before you answer too quickly, let me, just, let, me just, let me just challenge you a bit. One of the things of living in a culture is that you don't even realize that you adopt the values and beliefs of the culture that you're in, typically until you get outside of that culture and then you can observe, wow, look at some of the things we believe. And when it comes to life in the secular West, the Western world, there is this great, great thing that in the West where we divide the sacred from the secular. We, take, we say, you can have faith, but you better keep your faith in, in private and don't bring your faith out into the public square. Now, this is spelt out by the fact that if you were to go to shops in Adelaide, you would find that in none of the shops in Adelaide, there would be shrines or incense burning, or little idols in those shops. And the reason is, is that as Westerners, we believe that faith is a private thing, and shops are a public space, so you don't bring your private faith out into the public square. But who here has been to Bali? All right? Or to Asia, or maybe you come from Asia, you'll know that in those sorts of countries, in every shop you go into, there's like a, a cat, <laughs> like... There's like little, you know, there's like, um, there's like incense burning, there's idols, and that's because for people from other cultures outside of the West, there is no sacred secular divide. There, faith is a public thing, it's not a private thing. Now get this, guys, get this. Listen, this is the most important thing I'll say today, all right? Get this. When you add that to a particular evangelical belief that the gospel is just my ticket to heaven, then what you get is you get a bunch of Christians who will come on Sunday and they will sing the song, one fine day when this life is over. Ready? I can't remember the next verse, but, <laughs> but they'll sing that song and they'll celebrate the fact that they've got their ticket to heaven. But then from Monday through to Saturday, they don't understand how the gospel relates to any other part of their life. They don't know how to bring their private faith out into their public life. They don't know how. And so the rest of your life, you'll go out from this place and you'll actually live like a Chaldean. You'll actually think that the material world is all that there is and all you have is human wisdom. And so what happens is that when you encounter suffering, when you encounter pain, when you encounter hardship, I find you in my office saying, what is going on? Because I've never equipped you to actually take the gospel, not just in this room, but to take it out into your everyday life. You know, this week I was talking to a guy that I mentor, and um, 
he was telling me about this situation this week about how his boss, she was giving him a really hard time in his, in his work. And, and I said to him, do you realize that that moment is a profoundly theological moment? It had never dawned on him. So that moment right there is a profoundly gospel moment. If you believe that God controls all things, then he is controlling that moment and he can give you wisdom, truth to help you deal with that moment. And I said to him, you know, because of the gospel, because you're righteous in Jesus now, you don't have to establish your worker righteousness. So when your boss is unreasonable to you, you don't have to establish your worker righteousness. You can just turn the other cheek. You can take it and you can just say to your boss, you know, my work is my worship. That's what I do as a Christian. My work is my worship. And how would you like me to respond in future? And I said to him, you know, if you responded like that in that moment, let me tell you, she would be blown away. Absolutely blown away. Because people typically don't respond like that, do they? You would shine like the stars in the heavens. Unfortunately, what I see Christians doing is because they bought into this idea that the gospel is just their ticket to heaven and the sacred secular divide, they, live, they, they do either one of two things. They either assimilate into the culture and they hold on to the fact that some, sometime I prayed this prayer and I, I walked an idol and I got my ticket, but they live just like everyone else and they no longer go to church or else I see this other thing that what happens is rather than assimilating into the culture, they separate themselves from the culture into cultural enclaves of Christians where they can encourage each other to wait on till the rapture. But I tell you, God has got something way better for us. Rather than assimilating into the culture or segregating us from the culture, he wants us to be his instruments of peace in this culture. Where we take the gospel that we preach and teach from this place and we go every day of our lives as the church of Jesus Christ and we be salt and light in the police force. We be salt and light in the universities. We be salt and light in Allegiant. We go and be salt and light where God has placed us. And let me tell you, my friends, that's what makes Christianity exciting. It's not very exciting, I think, your Christian faith, if it's just about turning up for two hours and hearing Tim on speak on a Sunday morning, going to a real-life group on Wednesday night. If that's the sum total of your Christian experience, that's not very exciting. But what is exciting is when we view our lives as this, as being as being like Daniel, God's people in God's place to bring God's wisdom into situations, God's truth into situations. Man, that's exciting. I told this friend of mine that I was mentoring, I said, you have a better mission than I do. <laughs> You're on a mission to bring God's presence and God's redemption into that workplace. And all I have to do is just equip you for that. What an exciting mission. Now, when we do this, do you know what will happen? If you really get hold of this, guys, if you really get hold of this, there may come times when you, because you're different and you're shining like the stars in the dark night, you might get to share your faith with the highest levels of people in society. This is what happened to Daniel. Look down in verse 24. We read, Then Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went in and thus said to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles of all places from Judah, a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Remember from last week, Daniel is in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar in that great throne room. They said in the throne room, there were lions tied up in the throne room. It was so intimidating. And so here's Daniel's opportunity. But look what he says. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or astrologer can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But what does he say? But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. 
And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what will be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what will be. But look at this. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me. And what does he say? Not because of any wisdom that I have. And anyone else, he's making sure he points them to God, the true living God. But in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Now, what was the thoughts of Nebuchadnezzar's mind? Well, as Lou read out this morning from verses 31 to 45, we see Daniel give Nebuchadnezzar the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to go into it in great detail today. So in your real life group, you might want to study it together or get alongside of a more mature Christian and ask them to give you some insight. But basically, the dream that God gave Daniel was of this idol with a head of gold, with arms and chests of silver, with a bronze belly and thighs, with legs of iron, and with iron and clay, feet, uh, iron and clay feet and toes. And this is basically what God was doing with Nebuchadnezzar was he was giving him what was going to happen in the next five centuries of human history. First, there would be um, the Babylonian kingdom would come. And then there would be the silver kingdom, the kingdom of the Mede and Persians. And then after that, there would be the Greek um, kingdom with Alexander the Great. Then there would be the Roman kingdom. And this is where there is still coming a time in the future where there is going to be a reconstituted Roman kingdom that will come in the end times with the Antichrist. But that's the content of the dream. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think, class, Nebuchadnezzar was so troubled by this dream that it kept him up at night? Why did he struggle so much with this dream? I'll tell you why I think it was is that Nebuchadnezzar had a literal dream. What was his literal dream? His literal dream was of building a golden image to himself, setting it up as a demonstration of how powerful and great his kingdom was. In fact, in the next chapter, in chapter 3, we are going to see that, that Nebuchadnezzar realizes his dream. He builds this big golden statue and gets everyone in the kingdom to bow down and worship it. But this dream that God gave uh, Nebuchadnezzar was showing him that what he was setting his heart on would not last. That the kingdoms of men would come and go until finally, this is beautiful, there would be a rock cut out from the ground from no human hand. That rock being Jesus. And he would smash apart the kingdoms of men. And bring an end to those kingdoms. And that little rock would then be the start of a mighty mountain that would grow up. The kingdom of God that would never end. Let me ask you, why don't some of you sleep at night? Why do you have restless night's sleep? I tell you why I don't have restless night's sleep when I'm a pastor. It's because in my heart, I have this dream unfortunately sometimes, of the church being this amazing church. And this, and then I'm bit this amazing pastor, and I get invited to preach at all the conferences, and this is my dream, a dream, a golden statue in my heart. And you all want to foil my dream. <laughs> and my circumstances foil my dream, and it, it keeps me up at night. Maybe that's why you are kept up at night is because your heart is set on building a kingdom, your own dream. But the beautiful thing is that Jesus, the rock, he has come, he's died, he's been raised from the dead. He wants to shatter apart your earthly dreams so that you will build your life on the rock. The ultimate foundation of our worldview is Jesus. And as Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and following, he says, as you come to him, the stone rejected by men, 
but chosen and precious in the sight of God, God can build you into a holy temple, a place where he dwells. Do you know what will make us shine like lights in this dark world? Let me tell you what will make us shine is when everyone else is freaking out, when everyone else is anxious and worried. We have our lives built on the rock, the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. And so in the midst of the storms, we can come like Daniel did. Everyone else is freaking out, but Daniel is at peace. And he can respond with that heart of peace, that heart of grace to the situation. And because of that, because he responds with wisdom, God gives him the opportunity to speak to the highest levels of that society. And I'm telling you that when we shine like that, not by separating ourselves from the culture or assimilating into the culture, but being God's people, demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness of God in our life in the midst of the culture, we will shine. But there are some people here today, and you did not get a night's sleep, a good night's sleep this week, and you were filled with anxiety, and I know what that's like. I've gone weeks without sleep, and I'm not saying that I can solve your problem right here, right now. Now like that. But Jesus, he wants to come into your life and be a firm foundation and he wants to build in your heart a kingdom that will grow into a mighty mountain that no man can ever take away. Do you need to come back to Jesus today and surrender to him? Have you been living like a Chaldean with a worldview set on materialism? Or have you been living trusting that God is in control? Let me pray for us. Lord, you are so, so wonderful and what a beautiful passage of scripture that we have studied this morning. And how amazing is it and how it points to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the rock. And there are people here, Lord, I know that have in their hearts set their hearts on the dream of having the perfect Christian family. And it hasn't been working out that way. Or having the perfect ministry. And it hasn't been working out that way. Or having the perfect marriage. And it hasn't been working out that way for them. But thank you, Lord Jesus, that you often allow us to go through difficulty to surface where we have been living for our own kingdom because you want to blow that apart, the kingdoms of men, so that your kingdom can come to reign and rule in our hearts and so that we as your church can be a kingdom of priests before our God. We can be the church on mission in Adelaide, bringing the redeeming love of Christ into every part of our lives, not just on Sunday or real life group or in the ministry that we might serve in, but in our workplaces and in our families and in our relationships, you want us to be the instruments of your peace, the instruments of your reconciling love, bringing your reconciling love to the world. Oh, Father, I pray for anyone here today who is struggling massively with anxiety. I don't pretend to know all the solution to that, Father. Maybe there may be other things going on, but I just know. Lord Jesus, that you have wisdom that you can give all of us to help us to deal with the circumstances and situations of our lives, even though we may still struggle in that to believe and in that to trust and in that to move forward. Father, I just thank you so much that you are so awesome and so powerful. Thank you for this gathering of worship as your body pray that your people would have been nourished by the word of truth today and the spirit of God working in us so that we can be your people on mission, your church on mission to bring glory to God and joy to our city. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.